sports, first-person shooters, racing and action titles. These are the kinds of experiences that many people think of when you mention video games. But as the technology that we play games on has evolved, so has the content of games themselves. Get ready. Do it. Games like Call of Duty and massive franchises like Halo have meant that games have moved into mass market entertainment. As they move into mass market, there are other stories that can be told beyond an action movie or a science fiction movie. People making video games can have more courage now about the themes they can address. Video games reach a bigger audience than they ever have before, which means you can have games with very deep emotional storylines. Away from the mainstream video games industry, the independent sector, while lacking multi-million dollar development budgets, is free to tackle more challenging material. In Kiev, what's this? Navid Kansari understands mainstream gaming. He's worked on titles such as Grand Theft Auto 3 and Alan Wake. His latest project is an altogether more personal affair. Called 1979, it's a game which explores the events leading up to the Iranian Revolution. Like many Iranians, Navid's family left the country as a result of that revolution. These events led to the overthrow of the Shah and the Iranian monarchy and ended with the establishment of a hardline Islamic State. We've got games in which take place in Germany, let's say in World War II, but your whole objective is just to eliminate the soldiers or eliminate the enemy and get to that next stage. But to truly actually understand what was taking place in that country, whether it's on the shores of Normandy or whether it's in the streets of Paris, um, never really gets divulged to the uh, audience. huh? Baba, this road is closed. Move along. Boro. Having made documentaries and having worked in video games, I find that what is really appealing about documentaries is that true connection to real life stories, to real life people. And if you can actually put that as a part of a game, then you're making so much more of an enriched experience for the end user. So I think it's absolutely crucial to bring history into it. And I'm surprised that not a lot of people are doing that. Hold up, let me check if it's clear. Designed for consoles, PCs and tablets, in 1979 the player assumes the role of an ordinary young man who's returned from his studies abroad to find his country in crisis. Stop! Up against the wall! The player must make decisions such as choosing political allegiances and who they will or will not help. Chia, what seems to be the problem? Well, let you come, Kari. What are you doing up there? The player's choices ultimately affect the game's outcome. Ichi, just taking pictures, I speak of you. Turn around, push on, bad guy. Photographs of real events and audio from the period all feature, and Navid hopes the game will act as an educational tool. It's argued that if you try to beat somebody over the head with, with education, that it's just not going to work. When I play a video game, I want to be entertained. But what I really love about games that I've played that have an immense amount of detail is that, ooh, I didn't know that. It's not that I'm getting hit over the head with it, but that educational element is kind of coming in passively while you're being entertained in the foreground. We do not fear you! But anchoring a game in the real world isn't confined to representing events which have played out on a global stage. <laughs> he won't stop. Perhaps the most personal example of a game based in reality is expressed in the indie title That Dragon Cancer. Don't throw your head, buddy, don't. A game that explores the experiences of its co-developer, Ryan Green and his family. Ryan's four-year-old son, Joel, has been fighting terminal cancer for the last three years. The game's title refers to a story Ryan's wife told to their children to explain how Joel was battling a dragon called cancer. I hate this room. So the first thing that we produced uh, is a night that I spent in the hospital with Joel. And Joel was very dehydrated. It was one of the worst moments in this whole experience with Joel because Joel was in so much discomfort and pain and I, I couldn't do anything to stop it. But also in that night, there was this moment of grace and peace that happened.
Oh God, I want to be here with me. Please. And I wanted to share with people both kind of the, the hard aspect of this night the, um, and being brought to the end of myself but also the grace that intervened. There are some things that video games can do that traditional media can't. And I think that I as a creator, I as an author, can, can construct this world and invite the player to live in it. And I can have a conversation with them um, by offering them various choices and various paths within this world. And uh, I think that that can uh, present a, a far more impactful and a, a far more immersive and a, and a far more uh, empathetic experience. In the broader game, we plan on making a game with six or seven scenes that are each about 10 minutes in length. So we're looking for an hour to an hour and a half. And it will explore the roller coaster ride that, that is living with cancer and battling cancer on a daily basis. <laughs> We have four children, and so um, most of the time is spent in laughter and the day-to-day -day, uh, mundane tasks that happen in life. Um, a very small amount of our, our life has been spent in the hospital. And so this will explore all of that. Whether it's recounting world events or telling stories like Ryan and Joel's, titles like That Dragon Cancer highlight the ability okay, of video games on. to have an emotional effect on the player long after they put the controller away. Go! Go.